Uh, and that's going to continue, I, I presume, I hope. I don't know. You know, I'm not Chinese, and I cannot tell them what to do. <laughs> but it seems to me that they are continuing to try to stop the property bubble, and they're being successful at it so far. And we're starting to see that also in terms of uh, slower GDP numbers, where they're lowering GDP numbers, where, where it's 7.5%, a little bit lower than the 8, 8.5%, just to throw numbers out there. However, I think people and corporations still see China as that huge growth engine. I really do. And my question to you is, what's the best way to invest in China's massive growth potential? Because it seems like... You know, when you're looking at just from the equity market, people have gotten burnt. Uh, the corporations, I guess, the multinationals might be away. But for someone like you who, who is long-term uh, bullish on China, uh, what are some of the ways that, that you're investing in, in, in that growth market? Well, I own the renminbi. I own the Chinese currency. Frank, you can't just pick up the phone and buy a lot of renminbi, but there are ways to buy it legally, and whenever I can, I do so. Uh, another way is to own uh, commodities because – the Chinese have to buy commodities. It doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about corporate governments or central banks or anything else when you own commodities. If you have cotton, they have to buy cotton from you. They don't have any choice. They will take you to dinner. They will pay for dinner. They'll pay their bills on time. If you've got nickel, they have to buy nickel, etc. So commodities are an extremely good way to invest in China. Uh, likewise, you can buy Chinese shares if you know what you're doing, if you can uh, read them and, and understand them. That's another way that Chinese shares which trade in various countries of the world, uh, including China. Whenever the Chinese stock market collapses, I try to buy more Chinese shares. I haven't bought any Chinese shares since November of 2008. But if there's a collapse for any reason, if there's a collapse for any reason, then I hope I'm smart enough to buy more. My Chinese shares are for my children. You know, if I'd sold my American shares in 1912, I might have looked smart for a while. But in the next 80 or 90 years, I would have looked like a fool. So that's my approach to my Chinese shares. They're for my children and grandchildren. Well, let's turn a page now to, to Europe real quick as we're coming to the end of this uh, interview here. Uh, would you invest in anything Europe right now? I mean, hedge funds I talk to trying to get their hands on distressed assets. Uh, I would be surprised if your phone's not ringing off the hook with some people offering you deals. Do you see uh, a, a, an area to invest in Europe, which a lot of people are looking at since you know it's been terrible, at least uh, some parts of Europe. But what's your opinion on Europe right now? You think the worst? You staying away from that market completely, or is there opportunity there? Well, first of all, my phone doesn't ring off the hook for people offering deals. So I don't speak with brokers. I don't speak with anybody. I'm, I'm afraid I'm very much uh, on my own here. I don't, and, and, and most brokers, all brokers know that by now. Uh, so I, I do my own thing. Uh, Europe, I own some euros. I, I've owned the euro since probably June of 10, 2010, when I beat it down a lot. Uh, I continue to own it. There are a couple of beaten down European stocks that I have on my, my list. I haven't bought any recently. I just want to make sure that's, a, that's an accurate statement. Um, and so, no, I'm not doing anything. I'm watching at the moment because, you know, the markets, as you started the conversation, I think the markets have been very strong for the first part of this year. I don't like to buy it when the train is, has already left the station. Uh, but if, if there's a correction and it looks like we might have one for a while, then I hope I'm smart enough perhaps to buy some more shares. But Frank, for the most part, I'm, I'm not buying shares. The best way to invest, as I said before, we may have serious problems in the world in the next couple of years. So the best way for me to invest is in commodities, as I said. If the world economy doesn't get better, I won't make money in shares. I might make money in, in commodities going forward. You know, the United States has had a recession, an economic slowdown, every four to six years since the beginning of the republic. Frank. Uh, this is five years since the last one started, almost five years. Uh, 2013 will be six years. So I, we're overdue. We'll have one. We always have anyway. Um, could be different this time, but it rarely is. So I'm, I'm really not too anxious to rush out and buy shares. Shares are near their all-time high. Margins are near their all-time high in the U.S. I don't see any reason to race out and buy shares, especially if history is correct. And we're going to have problems in 2013 and 2014. Why would you buy shares unless you find special deals? And I have a couple on the list, but I, since I haven't bought them yet, I just do not talk about them. Now, I want to go back to, to – again, we're coming to the end of this, to this interview here. But I want to go back to something you said earlier when you said over 40 elections are going to take place over the next 12 months, France, U.S., Germany, and a couple of, uh, of bigger countries. 
Uh, how much attention? And I want to I want to focus on this because I have a lot of individual investors listening to this. I know a lot of those interviews at CNBC, Financial Times, uh, uh, might be uh, you know not too much tailored to individual investors. However, this podcast is, and I, I want to stress how important is it for you to explain to individual investors how much attention you should be be paying to when when it comes to politics as individual investors in certain markets. I mean, how does that determine where you invest or if you increase your asset allocation in certain areas because of elections? Because it seems like you're it's the first time. I heard like 40 elections all over, and it seems like you're really focused on these elections right now. Well, I'm, I'm aware of them because the 40 elections that are taking place account for something like 40 or 50 percent of the world economy. <laughs> You've got to pay attention to something that's going to affect 40 or 50 percent of the world economy. That's not my main driver by any stretch of the imagination, but it's something that's, that's in the background and I have to know about. You know, the Chinese government is going to change. I don't, that's probably not considered an election, but you're going to have a change there, too, in the next 12 months. Uh, most of the time, this doesn't have too much of an effect at all, other than, I mean, it doesn't matter whether Joe or Sally wins the election, usually, but what it does matter is the fact that they're spending a lot of money. The, the major reason that I watch these elections is because that's when they spend a lot of money, that's when they print a lot of money, because they want to get elected. And the people who get that money are going to feel good and, and think things are better, and they are going to be better for them and their friends. But overall, as I said, you know, you got the source of the money, and the source of the money is disaster. It's they're borrowing huge amounts of money for all of us. And I would also remind you that taxes are scheduled to go up a lot in the U.S. next year. So if you have much higher taxes and we're overdue for a correction of our economic slowdown in the U.S., 2013 and 2014 will be bad. I have to watch that kind of thing, but I don't care whether... Uh, I mean, I care whether Romney or Obama wins because they're, they're both they're both the same, but uh, it's not going to have much of an effect because they're both the same. Now, on a personal and, and by the way, sometimes an election has a massive effect. Myanmar just had an election, and Myanmar, I'm probably more. I know I'm not probably. I am more optimistic about the future of Myanmar than any uh, any place in the world. That's the place where they had an election, and after 50 years of of being closed off, which is a very dramatic and important uh, factor. But most elections are not that important, other than for the macro background. Well, I, I heard you mention Myanmar before uh, on a CNBC interview, and also last time you were on this podcast, you also mentioned North Korea as a place possible to invest. How difficult is that to invest for, for, for people in the U.S., though? Isn't it? Aren't those very difficult markets to invest in from you, for U.S. investors? Frank, we, we in the U.S. live in the land of the free. So we're not allowed to invest in Myanmar. <laughs> other people can. Uh, many other people, nations can. And then they're piling into Myanmar in a huge way. While all of us from the land of the free cannot invest there. Because, you know, people like the Clintons and the Bushes and the Obamas tell us it's not good for us. I mean, my God, we have to take our investment advice from, from dimwits like them. Uh, but we, as freedom-loving people, cannot invest in Myanmar. Other people can uh, I hope it opens up and makes it legal before too much longer. If so, it's still going to be difficult. I mean, they didn't even have a currency until last week, and so who knows if the new currency is going to work or not. Uh, there are many problems, transitional problems, in there, but if I'm right, it's like invested. It's like going to China in 1978. Sure, you would have had a lot of problems. It wouldn't have been easy. It would have been complicated. But, boy, would you have made a lot of money if you stayed there and worked it through in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, North Korea is the same way. There's no stock market in North At least there's a small stock, fledgling stock market in Myanmar. There's no stock market in North Korea. But I do see dramatic changes taking place. Other countries, are, their citizens are piling in to North Korea. Frank, again, I tell you, I'm a citizen of the land of the free. We're not allowed to do things like that. No, very true, very true. And, and I'm going to end with this, and this has to do with your book a little bit, so not so much about stocks, but when you look in the U.S., so many people, especially in the U.S., base success on how big their wallet is. You seem to mention in almost every interview nowadays uh, how much time you spend with your family. And I guess you know the last question here is, at this stage in your career, in your life, how, how do you define success? Well, what's most important to me is uh, having the time and energy and freedom to uh, – to spend time with these, my family, especially these two little girls, uh, that to me is, is extremely important. I, I do have the, the time now to spend time with them, and that's what I want to do. So to me, at this stage of my life, success is going to be 
how these little girls turn out. I just hope they turn out to be happy, happy adults someday. I'm trying to do my best to educate them and teach them about the world. That's what this book's all about, educating and my children from some of my failures and some of my successes so that they, too, can possibly have a, a happy and successful life in the future. Uh, yeah, you certainly need enough money to buy your freedom. That's one of the things I set out to do at a very early age. I don't care about money. I didn't have a car. Didn't, I never had more than one house, never owned a plane or any of that kind of stuff. I wear my old college clothes sometimes. Uh, I'm not at all interested in money other than to buy, except to buy my freedom and to be able to help these little girls in the future. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And I think, uh, you know, we'll end it there, Joe. I just want to thank you for, for taking the time to be in this podcast. I know you do a lot of interviews and you're a busy guy. So I really appreciate you coming on and talking to, to a lot of my listeners and giving them some advice. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Frank. I, all of you guys there are, are good people as far as I'm concerned. So keep up the good work. Thanks. I appreciate that. And I'll talk to you soon.